as you are logging on, check out the poll and say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from and what you do. We'd love to say hello. And we're just going to give a couple minutes for everyone to log on. I can't believe it's been like four or five months of Zoom panels and conversations. <laughs> I know. I know. We're so used to it now, but yeah. also hating it. <laughs> It's really funny watching like the least tech savvy people I know being like, I'm just gonna like whip up the record button on and like put a background of like tropical <laughs> trees. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. Let's just, just get a green screen. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, we've adapted. Um, hi, Arena. Hi, Candius. Thanks for joining. For the people who just got on, we're gonna start in a minute. Um, enter the poll, jump into the chat, say hello, let us know where you're tuning in from. Hi, Matthew. All right, I think we can go ahead and kick off. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Siri Cohen. I um, you know, working closely with Canadian Music Week and Spin Lab on putting together these virtual voices series. Thank you so much for tuning in and being here. Um, if you're in New York, hopefully you're weathering the storm okay. And if you are on the West Coast, lucky you. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation. Before I go into introducing um, our moderator for this chat, I want to quickly just call out um, we'll be doing a few polls, so jump into the polls with your, your feedback. If you have questions, put them into the Q&A section on your bottom um, navigation bar, you'll see Q&A, and we will get to questions in the second half of this conversation. And the chat is a great place to kind of connect with the fellow viewers watching, um, share a little bit about what you're up to, comment if something relevant comes up in the conversation. We definitely want to make sure this is interactive and fun. Um, Canadian Music Week, if, you, if you've been in the past, you're probably as sad as we are that we can't be together this year in Toronto, um, enjoying all the great panels, discussion, and the live music um, parts of the festival. Um, for those of you who haven't been, Canadian Music Week is over 30 years old. It's a, you know, an institution in Canada in terms of conferences and festivals. Um, and really, I grew up in Toronto it was the main way that I, you know, came to understand the music industry and met a lot of my future mentors and connectors and business partners. So um, stay tuned on cmw.net for the virtual voices series that's going to be happening on Tuesdays. And then also stay tuned for announcements for next year because I know the team is really keen to be back in person next year. Um, and we, um, yeah, we're excited to kind of continue. This is the first year CMW hasn't happened, which is pretty wild. Um, so with that, really excited about this conversation. I think um, as, you know, marketing evolves every day, um, Alexander Williams and Create Music Group has really been a pioneer in terms of understanding like YouTube royalties, but way more than that, understanding data and how to build artist campaigns and how to launch new music in ways that are really innovative and exciting. So I will hand it over to our great moderator. Um, Amy Wang is calling in from, Brooke, or from uh, Upper East Side, sorry. Um, and she's the senior editor of music business at Rolling Stone. Hey, Sari, thank you so much for having me and thank you guys all for being here. Uh, as she said, I edit Rolling Stone's music business coverage and that is anything from um, 
whatever happens on a daily basis, like all the TikTok stuff that's been happening just the past few days to broad sweeping trends, like uh, how the conversations around the charts are changing and how conversations around what a number one hit really is or how to really get there. So I'm here with Alex Williams, the co-founder and chief operating officer of Create Music Group. Alex, thanks for being here. Um, there's a, so the poll here on the side is what role do you play in the music industry for you guys? But Alex, I was wondering if you could answer that too. Like what role do you see yourself playing in the music industry? And can you tell us a little bit about Create and how it came to be? Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Amy, uh, for that intro. And thank you to you guys for having me today. Uh, really looking forward to uh, jumping into it. Um, so in general, like uh, Create Music Group, uh, it was built uh, to make it so that the average artist can make a living from their music. Um, I remember when I was growing up, you know, when, when I always remember with my parents telling me like, oh my God, you know, you're getting into music. What are you doing? Like, it's a joke. No one makes, mo no one makes money there. Only a few people make it. Um, and I think our mission, at least for me personally, is when, when I have kids, uh, I want to be able you know, in a real way for, I, I want to be able to have that moment if they want to come up to me and say, dad, I want to be in music. Um, I want it to be, uh, I want it to be looked at as the same way as, you know, I want to go be a doctor or I want to go be a lawyer. I don't, I think it's been taboo for a long time, the idea of going into the music industry. And that's something that I think we want to solve. I know that um, Daniel X said, said recently, he wants a million people to make a living from their music. Uh, I agree. You know, I want 10 million people to make a living from their music and uh, the more people we have the, the better and stronger this industry will be for all of us mm -hmm. yeah so on your on your roster there have been plenty of artists who've had huge hits over the past couple of years especially last couple of months one of them is takashi 69 who has been a bit of a controversial figure um due to being in the news due to his sort of legal situations and everything else happening so with regard to Takashi, what's the conversation like at Create about uh, how you take someone like that on and sort of how you work with them and why? Totally. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, because we started out as a company that was helping uh, artists monetize their music on viral platforms like YouTube, um, we excel at working with artists that have virality. Um, nobody's been more consistently viral in music uh, at this time than Takashi 69 and um, recently he even uh, shattered the Instagram live record for the most viewers all at once with 2 million people. Um, so when he started releasing music on his own, he came to us partner with him and, um, you know, we wanted to partner with a powerful advocate for independent artists. And uh, that's exactly, you know, what we are. Um, as far as, you know, him being controversial, uh, it's our mission to be the most powerful platform available for independent artists. And, um, you know, we're not arbitrators, we're not arbitrators of taste. Um, I'll even argue sometimes, uh, but, uh, the CEO and myself, you know, some, we like something too much and it might not be good, <laughs> um, because we're not the demographic and, um, you know, we wanted, we wanted to make it feel like every artist deserved a shot and, um, mm -hmm. Yashi 69 included. And, um, that's what we excel at doing. Mm -hmm. For Takashi, as someone who is, uh, he's sort of like a, a case study for an artist who kind of shot up out of seemingly nowhere. Uh, how did your relationship with Takashi begin and what was the conversation like initially with Create? So he, he started he started releasing music with us with, um, was in, at 2018 uh, with the Dummy Boy album and we had previously already uh, been publishing him. Um, and this year so far he's released four new singles, including Trolls, which um, as far as we could tell is like the first fully independent record to, to reach number one from an independent company uh, on the Hot 100. Um, but, you know, I'd argue that nobody's better than we are providing a platform for independent artists. And uh, we're not owned by a major like uh, many of the leading independent distributors are. Um, you know, nobody can really tell us what to do or who to work with. Um, so we're just we're fully independent. Um, we excel above all else at leveraging YouTube, a uh, platform which has been enormously successful for 6 ix 9 um, So, you know, his first single Gooba that we put out this year while he, he was still under house arrest, um, we got the most plays of any hip hop song in 24 hours on YouTube. Um, and I think it was Eminem's Kill Shot who had that record before. 
And, um, you know, I know that he recognized the large efforts and uh, that goes in on our end combined with uh, his ability to engage uh, inc- with fans in incredibly viral moments. Um, so, y- you know, when I think when it comes back to it, like, I think we're just seeing this interesting shift in music in general where artists just want to release faster. And um, the landscape has just completely changed recently from albums to singles. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we're able to effectively distribute things in 24 hours and needed, which is very, very far from what I would say is like the traditional norm. Um, but, you know, we built our company and processes around being reactive to the needs of artists like 6 9 and um, which it's becoming only more and more prevalent with newer indie artists coming in. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's our job to support the vision of, of artists like that. And while we always dream of having like a month or two of prep time, <laughs> reality is nowadays that we need to deliver a lot faster than people are, are used to. And um, I think that was also a big part of it as well, was the ability to just deliver fast. And um, it's not something that, it's something that maybe you can do on a, uh, you know, a D- DIY site, you can put something up uh, probably within a week or so, but uh, to actually do a full strategy with, you know, many team members involved and get something online uh, with an effective strategy. Um, I think that was a big part of why he came with us was we, we built it around that. And uh, we continue, we continue even to this day to, to do uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of, releases that maybe don't have that kind of length and it's very very quick so i think that's probably a big reason for it mm-hmm. so create bills itself as the first fully independent distributor to ever land a number one on the billboard hot 100 which is obviously a sort of uh huge milestone and, and the hot 100 in particular has been uh, a sort of like uh, flag, if you will, to the industry that you've really achieved something that is worth grabbing everyone's attention. Can you elaborate on what it means to be a fully independent distributor and what the achievement actually means by the right. achievement of specifically landing a number one? So typically what you'll see is the majority of the time you're going to see the majors will take not just the number one spot, but more than likely the top 10 spots. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for, for any artist in your major like that, that, like you said, that is that is the platform right there for recognition, recognition amongst uh, uh, the industry. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, many of the other distributors uh, that the industry kind of considers independent, um, you know, i.e. like Billboard, uh, they're actually owned by major labels. So, you know, for example is, um, you know, The Orchard's owned by Sony, um, AD's owned by Warner, um, Caroline's owned by Universal Music Group. Um, so you're still forced to go through that pipeline and that kind of uh, uh, process to get things through, which is, you know, at big companies, it's, it's not like, you know, I can push a button and get something up tomorrow. I have to go through a, a whole ocean of people to get that to happen when you're using a, 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 a separate infrastructure for the, uh, the um, uploading of music. Um, we're privately owned. So the only people, you know, we kind of answer to are the labels and the artists that we work with. Um, and yeah, that just gives us a lot more freedom uh, to do what others don't. And um, to say that we were able to get number one is, uh, I mean, it, it was pretty unreal when it happened, but um, I think it is showing the gravity of the landscape shifting. Um, you know, it, it's, it's people, artists are, are able to communicate a lot more directly with their fans now more than they ever have been able to. And I think a lot more people coming into this are questioning, you know, uh, if why should I go to this next level if if I can develop the team communication uh, around me to do it for for a much better price point then um, you know it's 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 definitely changing the landscape a bit and um, yeah having a number one as a fully independent distributor I think is a very very good signal of what's to come. You mentioned earlier um, that you guys excel at specifically leveraging YouTube. Can you elaborate on what that means? And does it, uh, is that related to your success as an independent distributor? Yes. So YouTube in specific is, is it's, I'd argue it is the biggest music discovery platform um, of all of them, uh, simply because when you add you know, an audio or visual element together, as opposed to just an audio, you're, you're creating that much richer of an experience. Mm-hmm. And I believe that 
that is a main strategy for upcoming artists to diversify themselves from other people is to have something that's visually stunning. Um, in the world of TikTok and Instagram and short form content, um, I think it's important that people realize that you can make something that's effective and viral that you don't need to spend a million dollars on. You don't even need to spend a thousand dollars on. I think you just need to do something different. And uh, YouTube's a main part of the success because we feel like it's really, we feel when we look at YouTube, it is the indicator for the rest of the platform. So if, if the YouTube is gonna do well, um, if, if YouTube video is gonna do well, we can see a parallel success on multi-platform. Um, if the video is not engaging um, and people are not interested, then that could be something to signal that, hey, maybe people are just not as much into this. Um, mm -hmm. I'll also argue that audiovisual content is much more effective for marketing um, than just audio on its own. Um, you see that all the time with songs that may have been released for several years. They get put into a sync into a movie and uh, they get they get this breath this new breath that ends up you know pushing the song back into the charts sometimes and uh, on in, into ongoing success. So, with that being said, like yeah, YouTube is is a very very big cornerstone of um, a lot of our decision making when it comes to uh, uh, make, working with certain artists or, or making something go viral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other marketing tactics did you guys employ for the release of the Six Nine album in particular? Um, so, so this release in general was very interesting because um, I would say I should say these series of, of, of releases because we're we're working with a talent that is under house arrest. Um, <laughs> so to to be able to actually film things outside was actually impossible. Um, you know, and even even when it came to a. Uh, uh, kind of working back and forth, um, you know, he's, he's on the other side of the country. And um, we employed a lot of uh, strategy when it came to digital, because we knew that uh, the more traditional means like radio uh, weren't going to uh, pick anything up because you need a lot of lead time typically to work with radio. Um, and so we employed a lot of digital strategy in terms of virality, um, you know, uh, um, making sure that on multi-platform that we were we were advertising and making sure that people knew uh, that there was a brand new video out uh, is, is something that I think is somewhat overlooked these days. And I think it's kind of a cornerstone that, that labels and artists should be looking at is, um, you know, I always say the example of um, if I have a lemonade stand in a neighborhood and the neighborhood likes my lemonade, uh, I have two choices here. I can either, you know, wait for word of mouth to, uh, to get other people in other neighborhoods to uh, try my lemonade, but that's probably gonna take a lot longer than if I start s sticking signs up everywhere saying, hey, you know, voted best, uh, best lemonade in the neighborhood, I'm probably gonna get a lot more people coming to be faster. Mm -hmm. And um, as an indie, it's much harder for, for artists starting out to be able to have access to those funds to do that. Um, but also I think it is a telling tale that uh, uh, if, if the music if the music is doing good on its own, then you absolutely should do what you can to advertise and let the world know because, um, you know, you see a lot of songs that are really in the charts nowadays, top 10 still that have been there for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, but I'll still hear um, from, from one of my coworkers' dad, like, oh yeah, I just heard that new Weekend song, or I just heard that new, uh, you know, Selena Gomez or something, and maybe it came out a year and a half ago. So I think, there's this there's this weird idea that the second a song is put out, okay, it's already old. I think people need to give more thought to the lifespan of a song that that you know it's it's not just good to be be hot for one week. How do you carry that for weeks and weeks and weeks? Because there's so many different demographics of people that might like the song, and um, for every artist, it's different. Um, you know, for six nine, we we relied heavily on digital because. Given COVID, there's just a lot of people sitting at home and uh, they like to tune into the Takashi show. You know, they like to see the controversy. They like to see who's he, you know, who's he beefing with today? Like, what is it? It's, it's, I wouldn't say that the, the, the approach was so um, secret at all. It was, it was just more, um, 
look, there's a fire happening over here. How do we throw as much fuel as we can on it so everybody can see it, basically? And, yeah. um, and that yeah. was on Instagram, right? Yeah, so with Instagram, you know, the, the strategy was to go on Instagram Live first um, to really, really see, okay, you know, how many people are going to tune in? How, how big is this thing going to be? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it two million. So I was like, okay, this is going to be an interesting day. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we had put out the uh, video, I believe it was an hour, an hour before he went live. And then he, his numbers were shooting up on a per minute play on YouTube. And then once he went on to, um, once he went on to live, I think we saw something like in one minute, he had like 250,000 people pop in and watch the video so you know those two platforms actually are very complementary um i'd argue that that instagram is a very very good platform to advertise on because um you know the swipe up function is a very natural thing for people and you just have a lot you can get a lot more attention span there and um you know platforms like youtube and spotify probably the best traffic they're going to love is traffic coming from off platform so if they know that you're on instagram and you know, you came in from Instagram, YouTube's very happy. And they're probably gonna give your video a little more boost because it's like, hey, I took you away. I took a couple of minutes away from Instagram and now they're a couple of minutes on YouTube. So they prioritize that very highly. And um, um, so yeah, Instagram Live was a big one. Um, YouTube, obviously it, it was, uh, the video spoke for itself, I would say for these videos. Um, a lot of shock value really helped a ton. And um, yeah, I'd say, uh, you know, TikTok was also a massive, massive part of it. Um, you know, Nicki Minaj and 6 9 a very, very loyal fan base who adopted the song very quickly with TikTok trends. And um, we saw a very, very massive correlation spike between, um, you know, I, I believe it was, uh, we saw people like Charlie D'Amelio posting it and, um, uh, uh, and then uh, when that happens, you know, the amount of third party UGC videos and sometimes in the tens of millions that get made, um, everything just goes back to that song. So uh, using an effective TikTok strategy along with Instagram, uh, pairing with a viral video um, was where I would say we saw, we saw the most trajectory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems like the, the multi-platform digital release strategy was really, really successful for you guys. What do you think about the physical component of it? And I ask specifically because Billboard recently announced that it would change its chart rules so that it would no longer count bundles around things such as um, concert tickets, merchandise, um, cup holders, shoes, whatever you might want to bundle music with. Um, <laughs> that, do you guys have a particular attitude towards that? And what do you think of the, the rule change? So. It's been super, it's been super interesting because like, mm -hmm. we believe it's been incredibly unfair in general for, for, uh, for indie artists. Um, just because the idea of like, if you buy a t-shirt that has a digital download attached to it, um, that counts as a music sale and, and you can buy up to four, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, I can only buy one time a download on iTunes. Um, why is it now that I can go buy four things of merchandise and those things all sell and I'm really just trying to buy merchandise and um, digital downloads are just kind of added on as a, here's an opportunity, you know what I mean, to, to purchase something. Um, I don't think that really measures music consumption truly. And um, I think like, I do think that Rolling Stones charts are actually a lot more accurate. Uh, they're much better measurement of today's uh, like true music consumption. Um, I mean, who's really listening to, to terrestrial radio? Like, let's be real. <laughs> um, like buying a t-shirt or a concert ticket, it just doesn't measure music consumption. So I think it's pretty ridiculous to be honest. So I think it'll probably at least level out the playing field a bit for um, um, indies coming in. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the less value we give towards, towards merchandise purchases, I think it's, it's gonna be much better for indies overall. Mm -hmm. How do you guys view, putting aside the chart rules, how do you guys view physical as part of the marketing and release strategy? So it's interesting because like, um, especially now with touring gone, you know, like merchandise is truly one of the big, big businesses for, for artists. And I think that 
that is kind of like the way that you need to supplement everything as you're doing it is not just putting out the music you have, but um, really selling merchandise is, is, it's such a mainstay for a lot of big artists. Um, so I, I, I think like the way, I guess if I could take it back a little, like the way that the charts determined um, in general, it's, it's like a combination of factors that includes like streaming music, you have terrestrial radio, you have digital downloads, you have uh, physical recordings, you have merchandise sales. Um, and, and if you're an indie artist, you just, you can't play the radio game. It's just, you're never gonna, it's impossible. It's, it's way too much money. Um, it's, you can imagine how much coordination it takes to, uh, not just financially, but the idea of like, hey, look, I have this song and there's thousands of these radio people across the country to get it to them and to get them to take the time to listen to it amongst the other thousands of things they're sent a day. It's a very expensive venture and it's very out of reach for people. Um, it's, it's just too expensive. So, you know, and then you have the physical product merch sales. Um, when you can buy four copies of something, um, it, it's, it obviously kind of skews things towards a majors, a major, because, you know, they, they, the most creative work goes into making merchandise and typically the player with the most money can make more creative options. So I can make 30 t-shirts instead of five and I can probably gauge, you know, something that maybe a teenager will like, and also maybe something my grandma will like. Like I can make such a massive range of products when I have an unlimited pocketbook. Um, it's very different for indies. Maybe, you know, like if, if you're gonna focus on merchandise, um, you can only make maybe four t-shirts and a couple of small things, um, but it is big profit for these people. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so, so I think going back to it, um, I think that merchandise is, while I don't believe the rules are, I think they're getting better in terms of how they weigh merchandising for the charts. Um, I still think it is a major, it is a major stake for indies to actually make money right now, especially with, uh, with no touring. So um, mm -hmm. it should be a big cornerstone for indie artists to, to figure out their merchandising strategy and um, try to create something tasteful, but also realize that this isn't the only merchandise you'll ever sell. And um, uh, I think some people kind of, I, I have seen a lot of artists that get very, very, very tough on the kind of merchandise they sell and they get very, um, almost caught in the weeds with it, I guess you would say. I think it's like, look, make the merchandise, move on, move to the next one. You'll see that a lot of people maybe like one item over the rest and focus your efforts on doing more of that style because even if you as an artist might like certain merchandise, your fans could be a completely di different demographic um, than you think. Uh, and, and I think that that is, you do need to take that into account. Um, you know, for, for, for 6 9 we noticed that very brightly colored uh, merchandise works better. It's, it's you know, and I, I do think a, a part of the success is the idea of, you know, if, if I'm a teenager, or if my future kid is going to walk up to me and say, hey, dad, I want to buy this, you know, this, this cool red jacket with the Nemo shark on it. I'm not going to think twice about it. I'm like, here you go, kid. Go, go buy your favorite jacket. But I think some artists like to think too much creatively that they don't connect with the actual fan base that's listening to the music. And uh, I think that is that is something that they need to keep in mind is like you are different than your fan base. Your fan base makes you. And even if you, even if you, you uh, might like a certain thing and your fan base doesn't, you should probably listen to your fan base because they're the ones that actually kind of pay you. So it's, it's the, always adapt to what they want. This is pretty much the best thing <laughs> I can say on that. <laughs> what would you say to indie artists who have limited budgets or are just starting out? How can they launch new music in a unique way, an intention-grabbing way? Um, I think I think it's important to understand that we're in a we're in a quantity versus quality. Um, I should say you should always strive for quality, no doubt. But when you're trying to when you're starting out you want your fan base to come to you. And that means you're gonna to have to try out a bunch of different stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so one of, this, one of the easiest things that, that people can do is that I, I, I still don't see a lot of these days is 
you need to use Instagram. You need to use TikTok. You need to, you need to connect with your fans. You need to ask them questions, understand who they are. Uh, we're a very data-driven company. We, we look at everything. We turn every rock over to see where, where are these people coming from. Um, and I think your, art, your artistry and your business, is, it's the same thing. And uh, while I do believe that everybody dreams that I want to be, you know, I want to have the, the, the storytelling of someone like The Weeknd, you know what I mean? Like there's so many artists that I see that put out, they make tremendous, tremendous music, but um, they, don't, they, they, they don't supplement it by being online, by seeing their, their fans, by asking them questions and being engaged. And typically when that music comes out, it goes completely undiscovered. Um, because there's this expectation that I made great music and the rest is going to work itself out. Um, you know, and I think that there's even that same expectation when somebody goes to a big label or they go to somebody uh, or like a major label where they get all this money and it's like, okay, cool. I'm set now. I don't have to worry about anything. Um, it's not true at all. In fact, I think the more investment you get, the more, the harder you have to work. Um, but it definitely comes down to, um, engage on your socials. Um, quantity over quality. Uh, if you, if something's working for you, a certain style, like if you tried some new style of music that maybe you didn't do before and people reacted very well to it, listen to those signals. Don't ignore your fans. If they like that, hey, I got a helicopter passing. <laughs> um, if your fans like that, um, that's your product. So they're buying the product. So keep making more of that product. Um, and then, you know, you can, you can try stuff out later, but in the very beginning, it's about get, get money because you need, you need to have something under your belt and try to support yourself in order to keep doing this. That's, uh, that's much more of a problem is, is artists saying, I'd rather do my own thing and not make a dollar, um, rather than, you know, listen to your audience, listen to data, feed feedback and just work from there. So engage, engage a lot, put out a lot of stuff in the beginning until you figure out what it is your people want. Um, you can focus on albums and stuff when you actually have a, you know, a following that's going to listen to the album. Um, so yeah, that's probably the biggest thing I can give there. <laughs> Speaking of data, how does data analysis play into the operations of Create? Like, What specific metrics and platforms do you look at? Um, and was there sort of trial and error at first looking at one thing and now looking at another? Does it constantly move? Yeah, it constantly moves around for sure. I think there was a lot of trial and error beginning in the beginning. Um, one of the big things that we, we, we do use here is uh, we, we like Chartmetric. Chartmetric is a great program. I do definitely... Um, I want people to, to look at chart metric and truly realize like how powerful it is. But also um, another one is we look at Instagram engagement very heavily. Um, if, if somebody has a hundred thousand followers, but there's only five comments on his latest post, that's a big red flag versus if you have a hundred thousand followers and you have, you know, 10,000, 20, 30,000 likes, um, you know, people are, there's hundreds of comments. Um, I know that those fans are more likely to actually do that extra action of purchasing a product. You know, I mean, how many people, how many times do people recommend even a 30 minute TV show to us and we don't watch it? You know what I mean? Like, I don't want those kinds of people. I want the people that's like, yes, I want to watch that. I want to go in there. And I think it's the same thing with music is you need an engaged audience that, that like, so one of the first things is I'll look at likes, I'll look at comments, I'll, I'll see in general how many times this person posting, uh, do they go to stories, do they, um, do they, do they create a conversation? Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing I'll look at very heavily is we'll look at um, YouTube. YouTube's a big one because especially, uh, you know, in, in your art form of being an artist, I think it's important to not ignore YouTube as part of a requirement like you need to put out visual content because um you literally only have a few platforms that you're going to make serious money from and you better be maximizing all those um i'll look at uh we'll look at um spotify do they have have they submitted official photos for their profiles have they uh, there's there's all these tools are available on, on on the main platforms whether it be apple music spotify youtube there's there's always something you can do to make yourself more present on these. And if I see that artists aren't doing that, um, 
again, red flag. It could mean that maybe there isn't a good team around them. Um, also, even what I'll see is when, when people come in, uh, we'll pay attention to the team that they're walking in with. Is it, is it just like 10 of his friends just hanging out? Or is it, is it a manager? Is it somebody that's, that's, you know, is it a, is it a business partner? Is it, maybe it's a friend, but it's someone that's so dedicated to this man's career that like he's there for, he or she's there for everything. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely pay attention to stuff like that because it is true. Like the most important thing is uh, a label uh, uh, and we're going to represent you as best you can, but if your own internal team is not there, it's very, very hard to work with, with artists because, um, you need those people around you telling you, hey, that's probably a bad idea, or hey, this is a good idea. So it's important to surround yourself with an artist, as an artist, with people that are interested in growing your career, are interested in working for you, uh, working with you to, uh, to make it better. Mm -hmm. Are there certain metrics that you think are really overrated or underrated in the industry? Um, overrated? Ra uh, I would say radio play is, is pretty overrated, I think. Um, I think something that's incredibly underrated, um, TikTok is incredibly, incredibly underrated. Um, it's, been, it's been getting a lot better for music, I'd, I'd say, the past, uh, this past year. But, um, you know, TikTok is just something that, that it is an absolute cornerstone for an artist nowadays. nowadays and... Um, I think you, you were, you're not doing it right if you're not using TikTok. Like it is the absolute essential platform that more people are focused on uh, than anybody else right now. And, and, you know, Triller as well. Triller as well in the U.S. is a big one. Um, I think that, that getting yourself on there and trying to engage audience is, audience is, 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 is uh, more than ever necessary. Uh, YouTube community. People don't even know that, that there's a YouTube wall. Like there's a, basically like a Facebook wall on YouTube. And it, when you post photos on there, it gets a tremendous amount of reaction. So, you know, if you have something coming out, you should be maximizing YouTube by engaging with your fans um, and, and metrics, just talking to your fans in the comments. I know that seems so silly, but, um, you know, if, if, for example, like if I was to, if I see a fan is posting, um, you know, like uh, uh, my favorite part of this video is that one minute, well, I'm probably gonna reply to that person because if that gets pinned to the top and people start clicking on that comment and going back to one minute on YouTube, hey, I might just create 50 or 100 brand new views out of that just by getting this thing to the top of my comments. So there's things like this that it's, it, pays to, it pays to engage with your fans very, very well. And um, you, you, you'll definitely, you'll, call, you'll create a lot more, uh, uh, will create a lot more hype around your releases when everyone's involved and excited for your release. So, yeah. so we have just a couple of minutes um, before we sh should turn to our Q&A section, which is where all of you guys have been chiming in. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically with 6 9 to go back to the, to the beginning of this, what was the most surprising aspect of working with him, whether that was a, a particular marketing strategy that you guys tried out for the first time or something unique that he and his team brought to the table? So. Um, when it comes to six, nine, I think like, um, like most successful artists, um, he's incredibly detailed and he's, he's very, very involved in, uh, every aspect of, of his release, every aspect of his career. Um, you know, he's always checking everybody like, okay, are we good to go on this? Okay. We're we good to go on this. Like, Hey, we need to change these around. Are you guys good to go? Um, you know, it, it's not one of those things where, um, he just kind of like, you know, okay, it's released and then he just does his own thing. No, he, he wants to know how every function works. Um, and something that, that a lot of people probably don't know is um, he actually edits all of his own videos. So he's actually very, very talented at video editing. He, he used to do it uh, before, before his music career. And, um, you know, he, he, he knows how to get people engaged. Like he, he, he knows how to get people like get the right angles and the right shots and everything, which is obviously very, very helpful for, for shock value. Um, it's, it's just, and I think probably one of the most surprising things is, um, um, <laughs> the, the, the videos we did while he was under house arrest, uh, uh, I, I'm sure you guys could like look back and notice it, but you know, these backgrounds were all done in one living room like that every video was shot in that one room. 
And uh, the amount of coordination it took from him to, to get everything he wanted, how he liked and everything, like this guy was up 24 seven, just taking care of this. But um, all the backgrounds are done with a, a car wrap. There's a car wrapper we used to do all those backgrounds. And I think that that surprises people because it's like, you know, even to us, we were like, oh, wait, that actually makes a lot of sense. He's a car wrap guy to, to wrap the whole living room. But um, uh, uh, that that's probably one of the most surprising things that pe I think people don't know about. But, uh, you know, it, it's good to know, like, if you're an indie artist, like, you don't need to spend a million dollars on a music video. Like, you can literally wrap your living room with a car wrap and uh, you could probably do, you can make something that looks pretty nice. You know, it's, it's uh, so just, just be creative about it. And um, I think that's kind of the big thing is, is six, nine is, is incredibly, incredibly detailed uh, in every part. So um, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the most surprising things about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So jumping into the Q and A section, um, opening this window, I'm just going to go through in order. I think everyone can see this, but I'll just read the questions out loud just in case. Uh, the first one is you distribute both six, nine and the Dalai Lama's album. When are they going to collaborate? Oh my God. <laughs> um, well, Harrison Jordan, um, I'm working on it. Let's see. Hopefully I'll get, uh, you know, <laughs> hopefully I'll get them in the studio together soon. <laughs> that's, that's an amazing question. I love that. <laughs> for you. Uh, and so next up, you guys work with a lot of up and coming artists, especially on YouTube. Have you seen any indie artists who've been really successful on the platform that have used um, specific or unique strategies? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say like, that's so hard because when, when you're working with 6 9 it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty insane, the, the amount of virality. But um, hmm. That is a very, very good question. Um, any indie artists have been really successful on platform, what strategy use? The big thing I think that I see a lot, and, and I'll say maybe this, this, this is relatable to up, up and coming artists, um, because it's very, very synonymous with YouTube, but um, when you look at, 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 at historically before music people kind of really got big on, on YouTube side of things, if you look at people like you, Logan Paul, for example, is a great example. Um, you know, this guy's phenomenally engaged, same thing as 6 9 very meticulous, very all about his work. Um, but when you look at him and you see uh, that this man made a video every single day for arguably the past three, four years, I, I don't know how long, but, you know, that's the amount of effort that it took to build that. But in essence, the reality of us all is this man was able to dedicate every single day like that. And that's a true dedication that I, I can't ignore that. Like that is something that I, I wish, I wish I saw more artists doing. And, and that's why it comes back to YouTube and socials is really like, this is, it's, you're providing entertainment people, but it's also, it's your job. You know what I mean? And, and take your job seriously and, and you'll get paid a lot of money for it, you know? And, and I think that is the kind of approach that I want to see more artists take post every day, every platform, everything. Um, in terms of music, uh, Disciple Records, uh, it's a dubstep label. Uh, they're, they're, a, they're a very big collective and they really built each other up. It was a lot of artists that were independently very successful. And um, together they combined and they, they, they are dubstep. They are the main stake of dubstep is, is their label. And, um, you know, that's what I do like to see as well as I like seeing the emergence of collectives. When you have several people in one group, uh, that may all work to, with the same team. Um, you you help each other out that much more, and um, you're able to leverage each other's audiences and and collaborate and stuff to really uh, um, not only not only have more music listened to, but sell more merchandise, things like that. So working in collectives, I think, is is something that in this new new year with no live performances, I think more people should should bank on that. The next question here is related specifically to platforms. Do you have a third party streaming platform to stream to all places at once? If so, what do you use? A third streaming platform to stream to all places at once. If so, uh, so I think I think I get what, what that person's asking, but uh, 
personally, I don't know <laughs> on that one. Um, I, I'm, I'm not as familiar. That's probably more on the, uh, the artist side of things, but. Um, um, Sounds I, like they might be asking for a distributor. Like that's really the distributor's role, right? Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's okay. All right. So I, I, I didn't maybe meant like live streaming for some reason, but no, we, we are a distributor. So what a distributor will do is, is we're able to take your music and we're able to put it on all the platforms, whether it be, uh, we send it to YouTube, uh, Spotify, iTunes, Apple music. Um, you know, we distribute to, I believe it's a uh, hundred plus, uh, uh, stores around the world. And, um, Yes, so that's we don't use a distributor. We are we are a distributor. We actually have our own direct deals with all of the platforms, so um, we don't actually go through any third parties to do that. Okay, Jill asks, can you repeat the name of the platform you mentioned for analytics before Instagram? I believe that was Chartmetric. Mm -hmm. So it's Chartmetric. Uh, I think they just bought Chartmetric.com, but you can Google it and it'll pop up. And I think it's free. Uh, or it's very, very, like, if you want to uh, do more features, I think it's a very, like, super small monthly fee. So uh, very cool because, you know, you get to, especially you as an artist, it's good at kind of telling you, hey, these are artists like, like you and stuff. So you should research those artists and what are they doing well and how do they affect their strategy? And, and uh, it's a very, very good tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chartmetric also has a number of um, free reports that they do on a, I think, weekly or monthly basis around just like trends that they spot on TikTok and various other platforms, which are pretty cool to check out. Yeah. Um, all right. So the next question here is for someone starting out on the business side of music, what's the most important quality you look for in a potential employee at Create? Um. I think probably most important thing we look for is, is traditionally we we haven't we haven't really since we're a young company I think the median age at our company is 26 um, we we haven't really gotten that place by hiring music executives and stuff it's, it's mostly people that are, are, are coming out of school and um, the biggest thing we look for in our company is it's passion it's truly it's the most important thing because I believe that I truly believe that passion will carry you throughout anything you want to do. If, if you're not passionate about what you want to do, then create is just not the place for you. It's um, you know, we have, we have a strong group of individuals that are all coming into a place uh, with minor knowledge or some knowledge of, of what, what it is to be the new music industry. And I think I, we like to have that blank slate of people who are just like, I want to figure this out. I want to know, what do I do to get something big? And I think there is kind of this old school versus new school mentality right now of, uh, um, and, 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 and if people are coming in with kind of those old school mentality tactics, it's really hard, you know, to kind of, to, to kind of change people's minds on certain things once it's kind of already set in stone. So I think that doesn't matter if you didn't you didn't go to college, you didn't graduate college, or you have a master's degree. It, it's it does not matter. The, the, what does matter is that passion, especially in a competitive place like music, will be the thing that um, you know makes you want to wake up at two, three a.m. in the morning. And say, I got this crazy idea. I want to write it down, or I want to, I want to, I want to call Alex or whatever. Because you know that's how we are as a company. Like anybody in the company, intern, whatever, can come up to Jonathan and I and just say, Hey, I have this idea. Uh, we don't have offices we, we it's very open um and and you know we we made ourselves be like that as as, as leading the company because uh, most of the great ideas come from young people you know uh, one of the the platforms we own is flight house which is arguably the biggest brand on tiktok and um um that was that was that was jacob you know jacob pace who who really who spearheaded that and said, you know, I want to do this and um, he carried it through. And now it's, it's has tremendous, tremendous, su tremendous success. And I think if you would have put him in a traditional setting of, of other music labels or even just general business places, he would have never gotten that chance uh, to say, you know, Hey, look, I think this TikTok thing is going to be really big. Like we should invest in this. Um, so yeah, so listen to your young people, I think is <laughs> the best advice, but uh, yeah, passion is, is what we look for. Mm -hmm. 
the penultimate question that we have here in our final two is how can artists submit music to you for potential partnerships and get your attention? So we have a, we, we have a, on our website, we do have a, a submission. Um, we also have a team of A&Rs that, that uh, are typically going out and looking for stuff. Um, you know, we, we right now are in an interesting place where as we do get bigger, we are, you know, able to take more and more chances on, on newer acts. But um, uh, we do like to see that, that somebody has some virality um, before contacting us, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, you know, we're, we're, if you're somebody that you, you are building your brand and, and, you know, you are getting sales and you're getting at this point, we're like, okay, how do I make this bigger now? Uh, then, then definitely contact us. But if you're just starting out, um, I would definitely say you have to work on yourself and you're going to be the most important person on your team because only, you know, your own vision. So, um, work on, work on getting yourself paid first is kind of the best advice is, is, uh, before bringing others into it. You know what I mean? Um, and I think that, that you'll have a very healthy career. Mm -hmm. There's one last question on our slate and then I have a, a related one. Uh, what are your thoughts on Twitter as a digital marketing platform? Um, Twitter's interesting. Um, I think, you know, maximizing your reach on any platform is always beneficial. Um, obviously, you know, I think we get most of our information from our president from that platform, sadly, but, um, it's, it's, I think Twitter, Twitter's, Twitter's a good platform. Um, we don't use it too strongly for, for our digital marketing, I would say. Um, just cause I think maybe the demographics a bit skewed towards uh, the older generations. Uh, but, uh, um, being, being, if it means being able to connect with fans and talking with them and showing them stuff, then I would give them, you know, the same, I would give Twitter the same kind of attention as you do Instagram, um, to be on it constantly and always, always be, if your fan base is there, always, always be communicating with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that, feeds in perfectly to my question, which is uh, tomorrow Instagram launches Reels, the so-called TikTok competitor, and yeah. that kind of thing is going to continue happening um, in to infinity, right? Like next year, something new will launch and the following year. How do you address new platforms and when is the optimal time to jump in? Does it depend on uh, the particular situation or is there a sort of playbook or rule of thumb you can advise? Um, what I would advise is when, when, as an artist, when you see that a platform is coming up with something new, that is your best opportunity to get ahead of everyone else because typically the way these platforms work is they want traffic going to these new features because they wanna prove that it's a viable source uh, uh, for competing. So, you know, when, when, when YouTube came out with community, you know, there was, I would argue, a very large favoritism of, of traffic being pushed to those items some, simply because it's like, hey, look, let's see if people like it. And um, so when something new comes out, that is, that is a great opportunity for you to get ahead of the pack. Try every single thing. Don't think twice about it. Anytime, anytime you hear that somebody's coming out with a new feature, artists should be the first to run to their computer and just like, you know, just research everything about it, learn how to do it, get, process, get, get stuff ready for it. Um, and you know, on a larger, larger scale as well, if you're a big label or something and you actually do have like some swing, you know, get in contact with the big people at those platforms. You know, there are always big, big music outreach uh, partnership um, people there at, at a lot of these big platforms. And who knows, they might give you funding. You know, like these, these this, the point of these new features is they want you to use it. So if there's an opportunity for you to say, hey, look, I want to make, you know, I have X hundred thousand fans, X million. I want to make content for you. Uh, you'd be surprised. You know, a lot of the times there's big budgets and big funds to get these people to do things. But the problem is, is nobody reaches out. Only the bigger companies reach out. And uh, I think that people feel that it's unfair, but it's like, it's actually, it's just a process of who, who reaches out. So, um, you know, if, if you have a platform and, and you feel comfortable, I'd like reach out to these people because you never know. They might, they might fund something for you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, be the first on it. Go for it. Don't don't hesitate. Try it out. It doesn't work. I always say you never forget. You never remember what you ate for lunch like Tuesday of last week. So, you know, there, it's a very quantity game. And if it doesn't work, it's not the end of your career. Like it, people need to throw that notion away. Like just just move on. Move on to the next thing. Uh, people people are people care about the journey, 
you know, your fans care about the journey. They don't care about you at this place. They care about growing with you. So. Yeah. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have today. Um, Alex, thanks so much for, for doing this and for answering so many thoughtful questions uh, and, and expanding so much on Create. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? Um, no, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much, Amy, for uh, having me. And thanks for... Uh, uh, you know, CMW for, for having me here. And, um, no, just, uh, yeah, anybody feel free to reach out, uh, um, and, and get in touch with me. If, if anybody here has any more questions, um, happy to help as much as I can. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.